we're very, very pleased and honored to have Dr. Cynthia Lane, the superintendent of the Casey King Public Schools here, as our as our lead-off speaker for this ongoing symposium. And I want to tell you a little bit about who she is. Um, she has had more than 30 years of professional experience in the educational realm, including 25 years in Kansas City, Kansas. She served as a special ed teacher, a principal, a director of the Wyandotte Comprehensive ed Special Education Cooperative, and before being named superintendent, she served as assistant superintendent for instruction and business. Her charge remains to see the community transformed by the important work going on in KCK. Giving kids hope is what being an educator is all about, and that's what initially led her to a career in the field of education. She grew up in Southeast Kansas in Parsons. Her family instilled in her the importance of hard work through their examples. And her time as a, a volunteer in the Parsons State Hospital gave her a sense of self-worth and taught her about the importance of helping others. It set the stage for her later years in the field of special education. What makes her happiest as the superintendent of the KCK Public Schools is seeing the success of others. And she's eager to lead the way, as not by walking in front of others, but by walking beside them and giving them support. One of her favorite quotes comes from a Chinese philosopher who said, when the leader, best leader's work is done, the people will say, we did it ourselves. When this happens, she knows she will have achieved success. And so, as a result of all of the work that you've done to lead the field, we're so pleased to give you this award on, uh, for leadership for learning uh, from the uh, special ed department and from the center for research on learning. Thank you very much for being here. We're so excited to be here. What an honor uh, when Dr. Deschler called me to say uh, that uh, you all wanted me to come speak about the work in Kansas City, Kansas. I was both flattered and a little intimidated uh, to come back to your university and, and share the work. But uh, I consider uh, uh, the experiences that I have of just this incredible journey that I have been on that, that truly did start with uh, growing up in a home where I had a mother who spoke English as her second language and living in a community where the state hospital uh, that served lots of individuals with disabilities and with emotional challenges was one of the major industries there. And, and being a child who uh, really performed well at recess, <laughs> <laughs> struggled to be a reader, in fact didn't read really until I was in the seventh grade. <coughs> so all of those kinds of experiences have, I think, come together uh, in the work that we're doing in, in but I'm so grateful to so many of you here in the room. I was sharing with Dr. Deschler that if it wasn't for Floyd Hudson, I, I wouldn't have uh, thought that I had the capacity or skills to pursue a doctorate. And uh, so I always will be grateful for many of you and for him for uh, inspiring excellence and saying to students, uh, you really can make a difference. So today I'm here to talk about uh, the work that we're doing in Kansas City, Kansas. And one of the things I always like to start with Many of you will not have these perceptions, but I always like to start with perceptions. <coughs> I can't tell you how many times as I'm out in the community in the metropolitan area that um, people will uh, make comments to me that reinforce uh, what they think about urban education. So let me show you this. Now that may not be your perception, and it's certainly not who we are in Kansas City, Kansas, 
But you remember the game Whisper Down the Lane? Or some of you might remember it being called the telephone game? Mm -hmm. Where you started a message and passed it along, whether it was true or not, that became the image. I want to say to you today that urban education is a uh, victim of Whisper Down the Lane. And in Kansas City, Kansas, this is who we are. into Schlegel High School thinking, I don't know what this is going to mean, but I'll get a, a meal, I'll be warm for six hours, we'll see what's going to happen. And immediately connected with one of our teachers who looked at him and said, my name is uh, Mr. Ammons, and uh, it engaged in the conversation. And the end of that conversation was, Alex, I believe in you. Whatever you need, whatever it is that we can do to support you, we'll make it happen. The significance of that story is that Alex at that time was living in an attic in an abandoned house and frankly really just came to school so he could get a meal, be warm, and stay out of the eye of the police officers. Did you notice that he had on a cap and gown? In a year and a half, that young man was transformed by staff who really cared a lot about him and he graduated in the top of his class and, and this year is in a community college moving forward to his dreams. Alex kind of symbolizes the work that we're trying to do at KCK. No matter those circumstances, we are pledging to take kids to higher levels of excellence. So today I'm going to talk to you about these three things. A very clear goal, aiming high, and this notion that it's up to us. A very clear goal, aiming high, and it's up to us. A clear goal that we have set that is for each and every student, not just some. Aiming high, realizing that graduation from high school is not our work, it's only the beginning. And that we must use tools that measure our work that are meaningful for our young people. And it's up to us, it's up to us, the grown-ups. It's about our capacity, our skills, and our willingness to do whatever it takes to move those 20,000 students to, su to success which we defined as having access to the middle class uh, lifestyle and experiences. But let me take you on, on a journey, a journey back. Uh, the district is 160 plus years old and has had 12 superintendents. I always like to share that with you 
because that should signal to you stability and focus in a board who really gets it. Now that board hasn't been around for 160 years, but the community elects folks to the board who really get the work. Now think about that, 12 superintendents in an urban school district in over 160 years. That is unusual, isn't it? It's very unusual. But even with that focus, back in 1993, we, uh, and I was there in the district at the time, um, I call it, had an ice water moment. The brutal facts of how we were doing in terms of producing kids ready for their futures. And it wasn't good. 11.5% of our students were able to pass the state reading assessment, and 3% of our students the math assessment. Now we have around 20,000 students. Uh, back at this time, we had around 18,000 students. So let me translate that into to numbers that are, are more significant. 2,500 kids could pass the test in reading, and 500 in math. Ice water moment. So lots of things could have happened then, but what did happen is that the district instituted a uh, reform called First Things First. And so it's like being in this cave. We were in the cave. We uh, were shocked by the fact that we were not able to produce kids who could demonstrate their skills on a state reading assessment, a math assessment, keeping in mind that was great level performance. With a glimmer of hope with first things first. And so that reform was all about organizing the schools into small learning communities. It was about relationship building. It was about getting to know your families and your kids, thinking that if we knew them well, we could figure out what's missing in terms of their education and move them forward. Very important. It was also about site-based, school autonomy, instructional autonomy, lots of opportunities for the school to decide, not the district, what it is that your children need and put that in place. And it was significantly successful. We are known as an urban school district who has actually improved significant levels over time. As you can see, this starts in 96 and goes to 2011, and we had significant gains with almost 70% of our children passing that state reading and math assessment. Unprecedented, really. But in 2010, when my team became uh, the leadership of the district, we began to say, is this the best that we can do? And uh, saw some light we figured out that when teams of teachers and principals and families work together, it can make a difference. But it wasn't enough because we realized that we were still leaving 40% of our students behind. 40%. So the question is, which 40? Would it be the ESL kids, the special ed kids, the kids that come from the most impoverished background? Is this truly what we want? And our decision, of course, was Absolutely not. While we knew that first things first was a valuable reform and we needed to build on it, we were beginning to lose momentum and to float. And the bottom line is we were sending children out into the world who couldn't read and couldn't do basic math computation skills, but maybe were passing classes. So I'll have you think about that. Measures on tests showing that they're not ready, but meeting graduation requirements with more than 75% you know, of our kids graduating on time. So the whole notion was, what, what should we do? Um, how do we begin to go about figuring this out? And so um, I, always, I love quotes, and I shared this quote with, with my team. It's a quote from Robert F. Kennedy to his brother, the president. And the guidance was, when you have problems, shine a lantern on those problems. And so we did. We went out into the community and had uh, David Smith, who some of you got to meet earlier, Chief of Staff, and I spent three months in the community speaking with teachers, talking with students and their families and the community, asking the question, what is it you want for your school system? And with, without uh, a doubt, in every group that we met with, they talked about the power of teachers in their lives. The fact that teachers sometimes were the number one influence of who they became. And that they wanted excellence. They wanted not just high school graduation, but they wanted those deep relationships to lead to the dreams that their children have and that they have for their kids. 
story after story about teachers who made a difference, who influenced life. They also said, we don't care about Kansas assessment grade level test. We want you to use tools to measure your success that have meaning to our kids. And our children said that you need to push us hard. We can do more. We need to do more. Help us with that. So out of those conversations, about three months of listening in the community, we crafted our vision and our mission statement. This is the mission statement. Let me share with you the vision. Our vision in Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools is to become one of the top 10 school districts in the nation. Now, that vision is not about scoring in the top 10 on a test, although we know that that's critically important. But it's about creating a generation of innovative thinkers who can truly change their world. And if you are living in a household of four or more, and your income is less than $30,000 a year, you need to change the world, right? So this whole notion of becoming the top 10 is that our kids become critical thinkers and can take control of their own destinies. And how do we do that? We do that by this mission, inspiring excellence. Every grown-up, every child, every day. And the grown-up piece of that comes first on purpose. I'm sure that many of you have had the experience, though I often have the experience, where I'm meeting with adults and they say, but if that parent would, but if only the students would. And that's counter to everything that the research tells us about the power we have as educators. If that child just didn't have that disability, or if they could just speak English. So the mission on purpose says to us, wait a minute, the research says, that if educators do their jobs well, we can overcome any, any challenge or circumstance that a child finds themselves in. So we crafted our work, and we're pursuing this notion of grown-ups do your job well so that children can have what they need. So that's all fine and dandy, right? Sounds nice words, but the question I had as a superintendent was, what do we do with that? How do we make that real? And we turn to uh, Marzano and Waters research. Uh, this had just come out uh, in 2009, I believe. And for me, as a, a new superintendent in a district that's had success but had 40% of its kids not making it, this became a blueprint for the work that we that we do. In and I, I know many of you know this research, but in the, the literature, he talks about Waters and Marzano talk about the fact that district leadership does now that the things that we determine to do at the district level can have significant impact on student achievement. For me as a superintendent, that said that my daily work needed to be all about student achievement and in the classrooms. He also, uh, in the literature, found that uh, tightly coupled instruction and achievement <coughs> goals matter. And remember, first things first was all about site-based reform. But this research, new research, said to us, you have to tightly couple what you're expecting and measure that and what you need to do. <coughs> also talked about uh, uh, setting and monitoring non-negotiable goals for achievement and instruction. And I want to sit on that word non-negotiable for a minute. Many of you have been involved in strategic plans that set out goals. And once that work is done, sometimes we pay attention to it and sometimes we don't, right? Marzano tells us that the work of the superintendent and the board and the building leaders is to not negotiate away from the goals that you've set. And for me, that was key. So how do you create a, an environment to lead in where people feel like they have voice and opportunity to influence while you're telling them that, that some things are not negotiable? And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we did that what we're doing. Also key in the research was the alignment of the board and the resources. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today except to say this. In KCK, we have had, uh, it's really been a blessing to have stability of board leadership. We have one board member who sat on our board for 30 years and most of them have served terms at least 10 years. And having that stability allows for focus and to ride through the storms of change to get the outcomes that you want. So I work a lot with the board to make sure that they're aligning their decision-making and the financial resources around the work of student achievement. 
And then the final big issue was how do you have non-negotiables, but you also have defined autonomy and grappling with that. But that, those were pieces that Marzano and Waters said were extremely important uh, in the work. So we crafted a district continuous improvement plan that is 20 some pages long, but reflects all of the pieces of the research where we had a singular goal, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, that focuses on the, uh, what we believe every child should have access to and the outcomes for, while crafting non-negotiable goals for achievement beginning at preschool through graduation and non-negotiable instructional expectations that will happen in each and every classroom. <coughs> So the, the, uh, the notion of uh, having one very clear goal uh, was very important. And there's been a lot of talk around the nation in recent years about this thing about college and career readiness. And I think that is absolutely on point, yet I worry that we haven't defined that. What do we mean by that? So in KCK, we crafted this singular goal. This is our only goal of our work right now, that each student, and the word each is on purpose, will graduate from high school fully prepared for college and careers in a global society and be on track and on time for success all along the way. Now let me break that down for you because that's a, a lot of verbiage. But what it means is that our success must be measured by the fact that our kids are ready for that next step from preschool into kindergarten. So we track kindergarten readiness. Did our preschool produce kids who are truly ready for kindergarten? We measure every quarter are our kids on track and on time, and if not, what do we do about it? We have set some key indicators in place that we measure on a regular basis and pay attention to that data. And we believe that every child should be fully prepared for college and careers, recognizing that not every kid will need to go to college to pursue their dreams, right? I'll show you in a minute why we want to develop that. Now, where are we performing in relation to that? <coughs> this slide shows uh, the number of kids who are going to college and completing within five years. And on the uh, purple lines, it's uh, for a two-year college, and uh, the magenta color shows a four-year degree. This is our data, case of K. It's not very good, is it? In fact, it's pretty dismal. It's almost like another ice water moment when you think about, wait a minute, what's happening here that our kids are not completing those post-secondary opportunities? So we wanted to dig deeper. And you can see here um, that our students in KCK find themselves in remedial coursework post-secondary at significantly higher rates than those across Kansas. Ours is the purple, the state's the magenta. How are they doing in math? Not a lot better. And uh, in the reading, you would see that same kind of thing. So if we're truly going to make that college and career notion come to life, we have to deal with the fact and put supports in place that address this issue, that our coursework is not preparing our kids for the future. I show you this slide. This is Bill Daggett's <coughs> slide from the International Center of, of uh, Leadership. And for, for me, this is significant because we often talk about, well, not every kid's going to go to college. Careers is where some of our students will end up. And when I was in school, that was called vocational, and that was really tracking. You really don't have the capacity to go to college, so let's find you a career. Some of you may remember those experiences. But the recent recent oh, <laughs> sorry, yes. uh, Recent research says that kids who uh, want to pursue technical careers are in the military actually, wow. Bottom left, right, it says Lane, right there. No, I think you just open PowerPoint again. Right there. Okay, thank you for your help. Reading levels in the high school and the literature, down here the Lexile levels for reading. College literature is slightly higher. College textbooks in the middle. But where do you see the kids that would be pursuing military and pursuing career occupations? This is a big change because now to be an electrician, to be a plumber, to be a technician in any kind of craft, you actually have to have higher reading levels 
than you do to enter into the college curriculum. This is important as we think about how we make that college and career notion truly real and relevant. Is this surprising to any of you? Have you seen this before? It's surprising to many of the families that I speak with. It's surprising to our kids, and it was surprising to our teachers to think about, wait a minute, I'm preparing students who may need a higher reading level than I have as a college graduate. Surprising. So we have to figure out what we're going to do about that. So for us, uh, one of the clear things that we needed to do is figure out a way to make that college and career goal for each student real and relevant. And we determined that one clear measure of that was changing the assessment that we use to measure our success. So we are one of three school districts in Kansas who have successfully received a waiver from administering the Kansas assessment to grades 8 through high school. And we have elected to use the ACT as that test. Because what we aim for matters. And teachers need to know what it is that they're aiming for, how their work is going to be measured. And the Kansas assessment, frankly, is getting in the way. I have to tell you that we applied for the way. Really, it was. It is still today. In fact, you know, this spring is the end of the Kansas assessment as we know it. And I, I, I applaud that. I'm looking forward to the next assessment that will actually require that our kids perform at higher levels. We applied for a, la a waiver from the Kansas assessment at uh, grades 3 through 7, and that was denied. Uh, frankly, because they were worried about allowing too many alternative assessments to be used to judge a performance. So at the elementary level, we have one assessment that is used to measure school improvement, and we have a higher uh, assessment from 8th grade up. And I want you to hear from staff about the importance of that move. So you're going to hear from uh, Dr. Mary, Mary Viveros, who's our district coach of implementation for secondary schools. Her role is to be in the middle and high schools to make sure that we're implementing our reform. Here's Here in the Midwest, is. the ACT is a test that's required by all colleges and many schools, post-secondary schools, uh, technical schools. It really lets the schools know where a student's skills and knowledge level lie as they come in to do their college work. So it's a test that really opens doors for kids for the next chapter of their education. And really just about all students need to go to some kind of education once they're finished with us. So by doing it during the school day, we ensure that those kind of other variables are taken away and kids can just show up and show it. It, does, it is unique. It's very unique. There, there are some other school districts who do it. Uh, uh, what makes us kind of doubly unique is that we are a district choice state testing school as well as a school that has the ACT in the uh, as our high stakes assessment as a waiver through the state. That combination together is quite unique in that this is our high stakes test and we administer it and it is actually a real, actually a real ACT. So put those two things together, and I don't think there are many other schools, uh, unless the whole state ACT is the assessment, as it is in some states. Uh, but those two variables are quite unique. And so it really, I think, allows us to focus our students' work away from where we were sometimes getting stuck on uh, just getting through a state assessment toward getting kids ready for college. So, Having the right target really mattered, aiming high. We began two years ago to give all of our eighth graders the Explore assessment, and all of our ninth graders the Explore assessment, and all of our tenth graders the plan, which frankly we've been giving for years, but it was take the test, here's your results, good luck with that, and the ACT to every one of our juniors. So last year is the first opportunity to uh, see that, and kids went into that assessment knowing how critically important that is to their life outcomes. Think about many of these children are first time college hopers. They will be the first child in their family to actually pursue that level of education. And we are um, really opening doors to their dreams. The kids went in very serious, came out in lots of dialogue. Now I want you to think about 16 and 17 year olds talking about an assessment together. Surprising, powerful, 
how important that was. But just giving the assessment in itself is not enough. So you're going to hear in a minute from Rashonda Rose. Rashonda is a college and career coordinator. We have a college and career coordinator at every high school. And her job is to make sure that all of the processes that you must go through in order to be accepted into college uh, are not barriers for our kids. She works with families to complete the FAFSA. She and the other college and career coordinators make sure that every uh, student has the opportunity to have their feet on a college campus somewhere, maybe in the metropolitan area, or perhaps somewhere else in the nation. She also makes sure that they understand how to complete the applications for entrance. And for me, most important, we track that how many students are successfully completing college credit while in high school. And last year we had 54% of our students graduate with college credit, some as much as an associate's degree. Transformative for kids in a community where high school graduation was seen to be enough. So let's listen to Rashawn to talk about it. I begin by saying our ACT process really starts well before junior year. A lot of our students obviously take it, and we have all of our juniors to take it for junior year. But our preparation begins <coughs> earlier. We're a part of the program that includes the plan, the explore, and the ACT. So we start testing students very early. We know that a lot of the scholarships and the um, schools that students really want to get into are requiring as high as a 21. And so it's really important to push our students, particularly in the areas of math and science. So we're working really hard to get them ready. Some of our students um, will move on into colleges, and those colleges we mean community colleges as well as large universities. But many of our students will also take technical careers, and some students will uh, join the workforce. And so we want those students to have the skills that are exemplified in the ACT as well. So we start working on those. We have for our freshmen, we're trying to make sure that those students pass all of their courses. Our sophomores visit college campuses. We'll have every single sophomore at Echo Schlager visit a college campus this year. Um, our juniors will work all year on the ACT. And then our seniors, we're helping them to do financial aid. We also do a lot of stuff on scholarships. We're doing preparation with parents as well because we want them to understand this process and the paperwork that's necessary so they can continue to be successful. So, having the right assessment and then aligning your supports under that. Um, I'm working with the board right now to consider changing our graduation requirements so that students have to have completed a virtual class before they graduate from high school or have been in college courses and successfully complete college work or actually graduate with a technical credential that will leverage the job that they want in their professional career. We also are requiring our students be in internships because we want to make sure that they understand the world of work and that they're out there working with real professionals, doing real work, actually being on teams and businesses doing the work. We have children, our uh, students at Cerner right now. It's been an invaluable experience. We have kids at Unum in our unified government working, actually creating the communication that our mayor's office uses to communicate his work to the community. That's being done by our kids. All of that crafted very purposefully so that we make sure that we are getting kids the experiences they need to be successful. Uh, let me talk to you a minute about um, what we're doing for uh, children that uh, are in preschool and up. One of the things that we're very proud of in our community is that we have an extraordinarily successful, fully integrated preschool. Oh, let me back up and before I go there. I apologize. I should have mentioned these. In the work that we have outlined, uh, remember Marzano talked about having clear achievement, non-negotiable goals for achievement. So these are our key indicators. We have, we have others, but these are the key indicators that we use to measure our success. Beginning in preschool, massive reading. We, we found that our children are not reading as much as they need to, and I would challenge all of us in this room, our kids and our families and ourselves may not be reading as much as they need to. So we have embraced this notion of massive reading and are driving toward having kids reading on grade level by third grade. Right now we're at 68% of our kids reading on grade level by third grade. We also measure their on track on, in terms of all the other academic skills. I mentioned every quarter we do assessments to see are they on track and on time for success. At the middle school, we focus on algebra at 8th grade, a gatekeeper for college adults. 
And so two years ago, all of our kids began taking algebra at eighth grade. And last year, 82% of them were successful in completing true high school algebra in eighth grade. And we mentioned uh, the college going and early college's experiences. So uh, the instructional expectations have also been significant changes. Under first things first, teachers and schools could determine what it is that they want to teach and when. We've learned that that was uh, not beneficial for all of our kids. And so we implemented a curriculum aligned to Common Core this year, last year to the ACT, beginning in preschool. We backward map that all the way down to what four-year-olds need to know and be able to do to be on track for college and career success. So the minute our four-year-olds walk into that preschool door, we're thinking about them as college going. So that was an important step. Under First Things First, we really didn't have a comprehensive curriculum. Now we do. Uh, the other piece of that, and most important, is having a highly effective teacher in every classroom. So we have intensive professional learning that happens on a weekly basis, and we have expectations for implementation of that. And our assistant superintendents meet with principals and our instructional coaches we call teacher leaders on a regular basis to look at data, to analyze how we're doing, down to the student level. High intense environment, support for teachers so they can make the best <coughs> all the kids. So uh, it's this is Kathy Stump. Yeah, and uh, let me pause for a minute. Kathy is a third grade teacher at Hazel Grove <coughs> Elementary School, and she's been teaching for 33 years. I want you to hear her voice and pay attention to the kinds of changes she's made in her instructional practice in order to meet the needs of our kids. Instead of me telling them, they're telling me. And that they just get so excited about that. And they'll say, she didn't, Mrs. Stump didn't know how to do that. And you, and you know, we're confident teachers and we are okay with that. <laughs> we are okay with them teaching us and that gradual release to them. We want them to do that. We want them to think. As the years progress, they are taking them, and they are teaching themselves, each other, and me. So they have ownership of that, and they're very careful. They carry it with two hands. They're, it's very um, ownership of their learning. When I started, computers were not even a thought. <laughs> and when I think about them using iPads and <coughs> much more global that um, when I look back they were just a thought in someone's mind and so I had to go and look it. So for me what strikes me when I listen to Kathy talk is that she has moved from being the one that delivers the knowledge to using uh, her students to be co-teachers with her. That she has, she's okay with releasing that. And she has technology tools that allow that collaboration to happen with her kids. She mentioned the word global. Kathy gets it, that we are not preparing kids just to be successful in KCK, but that they have to compete on a global basis. So now to the preschool. Uh, we are very proud of our, our preschool uh, program, and we want to continue to grow that. We have around 800 children who come into the district in various locations for a high quality preschool. And this is a fully integrated preschool where you have a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher and, and paraprofessionals working with groups of kids in a rigorous curriculum. Pay attention, if you would please, to what you see in these pictures. These kids are learning to read and write and early numeracy as early as age three and four. A few years ago, we would have said, that can't but they truly are engaged in this authentic work. And we think this is vital and want to work with our community to continue to expand opportunities for young children to come in and have quality services. We embrace parents as teachers. We continue to grow that. So beginning at, even before birth, we're working with families to make sure that they understand the importance of and learn the skills to develop kids. And I was very pleased that two years ago we took back the lead agency for infant toddler services, realizing that we have to make sure that our children with disabilities 
are receiving the kind of support they need. And leveraging all those resources together to move kids together toward that singular goal of being prepared, fully prepared for their futures. But we have children uh, who come from around the world, and our kids uh, uh, speak as many as of 65 different languages in their homes that come to our school. 65 languages as of today. That changes on a daily basis. So I wanted you to have the opportunity to see one of our ESL teachers and how she's grappling with ensuring they learn the content while they're learning English. This is Lori Holtz at Wyandotte High School. The students Can you hear that? that? Are generally the ESL students um, that speak languages other than English or Spanish. But I also have my primal, probably more so than any other language, I have Nepali and Burmese students. Um, I have a lot of Nepali students, um, probably five to ten per class usually. Um, I have several Burmese students. I have Kareni, Karen students. I have Myanmar. Um, I have I have had in the past some that spoke Hmong, um, Chin, Korean, um, several different languages. So it's kind of a in, in any given class I could have up to 14, 15 different dialects going on. The assessment process is sometimes difficult for students because they have to read an English, uh, an English written test and interpret what the English words are and be able to do the math involved in it. So uh, kind of a way to get around that is that sometimes I will take um, a unit and instead of them having to read the English words and try to figure out what the English words mean and, and then do the math, I will actually have them find a partner that speaks the same language as them and teach the concept to that partner in their own language. So uh, a student might be learning how to factor. And so instead of factoring and saying, okay, first step is I have to find um, my A, my B, and my C and do all the things in English, they're now taking a, par a partner that also speaks the same language and they're saying it in their language. And as a teacher, I can follow along as they're doing the video and assess whether they're doing the steps right, because the steps pretty much generally look the same, if, but obviously the words are different in their language. So they will be saying it in their language, and then I'll be watching them as they're explaining it to the student and watching their steps. And if they're doing it correctly and they're doing the process correctly, they end up getting the answer that is the intended answer, then I know that they've, they've one, learned the concept. They've, two, learned it well enough to explain it to someone else. Right? Amazing to think about having all of those languages in the classroom. I would be overwhelmed. How do I possibly approach this in order to make sure the kids are learning? But because of those deep relationships, Lori's able to leverage her students to help make sure that everyone knows the content. And she's focusing on the content and as they are developing the English. So she's a great example. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about special education. This is Tammy Hedensgaard, uh, who I'm pleased to say was nominated by our district as Kansas Elementary Teacher of the Year this year, and excited for her. Tammy is remarkable to me. She teaches children who have significant disabilities, and she's teaching them this, the, the literacy skills, the numeracy skills that we want for all of our kids. For me, Tammy emulates a person who believes that we shouldn't put the barriers, the challenges our kids have in front of them and accept that that's all that they will need and become. She has an amazing ability to push our kids to higher levels. And so even with all of the challenges that her children face, she is moving them through this rigorous curriculum, adapting it as she needs to so they'll be successful. Now you see her here with kids in a pull-out situation where she's focusing on literacy. Most of the day, these children are in a regular class with supports, learning side by side their peers, and it's a, just a remarkable experience. As a special educator, I think this is vital. We, we must move special education to uh, realize that the kids with the challenges have to have the best teachers we can possibly find in order for them to truly have a chance and a successful life, whatever that might be for them when they leave high school. Last night I had the chance to be at a board meeting where we honored 
students that are in our 18 to 21 year old program. And those kids have jobs uh, that they're working on independently. They, they have volunteer experiences that are developing their skills. For me, it was, it was heartwarming uh, because a few years ago, we would have hoped for them to be in a day program where they may or may not be doing meaningful work. Today, we're reaching much higher outcomes. So it's that single goal that pushes our people to say, wait a minute, you really didn't mean every kid, did you? When you said college and careers, but really, truly, we mean preparing every kid, not just some of our kids. So that's Tammy and her work. This is Rich Zach. My personal improvement goal is I want to get better at managing the students being at different levels. Uh, it's one thing to have the students at different levels, and it's another thing to most effectively guide, give them individual guidance, and do that as quickly as they need it. And so that's one of the things I'm still learning. Every teacher wants to be able to reach every student where they are. That's what that differentiation or differentiated instruction is all about. So uh, that's what drove me to try it, and uh, and then the technology is what what enabled it. But what I'm trying to do is I'm I'm using the technology and taking advantage of the the laptops that our kids are blessed to, to have to kind of multiply myself 25 or 30 times, however many students I have in the class. And meanwhile, that's freed me from being in the front of the room and I can move around and work with students uh, at whatever place they, they need me to work with them. Um, so it, it's really a liberating thing for me in that it, it allows me to really differentiate the instruction that I can do in my classroom because each student can be wherever they are and I can be responsive to that student where they are. So Rich is a, uh, a teacher of a second career for him. He came out of the business world and has been teaching for three years. And he's embraced the flipped classroom like many of our teachers have. All of our high school kids have laptops 24-7 that the district provides. And so they are leveraging that resource. And for me, what was so powerful about Rich's sharing is that this has allowed him to truly differentiate for his kids and to spend time not in the front of the room and lecture situation, but individually coaching kids so they understand the concepts and can apply those. So it's up to us. It truly is about having teachers who are willing to do whatever it takes and just to meet the needs of the kids. Um, our recent AHA, cold water data, if you will, is thinking about literacy. Because even with this strong curriculum in place, teachers really learning to differentiate well and support kids, we still aren't moving in, in terms of really moving those ACT scores up. So we began to dig underneath that. Here's our, our uh, literacy results on the measure of academic progress and on explore, plan, and ACT. And you can see that we have a long way to go in terms of making sure our kids are fully literate. So our current work, building where we are and moving forward, is to truly make sure that our children become literate citizens. The Literacy Council has embraced this notion that literacy is a civil right. Those are our teachers. We want to make sure that our kids are fully literate. So just real quickly, I want you to hear from uh, Peter Wenzel, who teaches at um, Frank Rushton Elementary School. He's a fifth year teacher. And as he's speaking, notice how he's trying to leverage digital literacy with his kids. Notice how he's pulling his families in. And what he doesn't talk about that I want you to see in the background are the classroom libraries. Because we have implemented that children in elementary school need to be reading between 5 and 25 books a week at school with us. It's significant. Here's so, with the reading, I have been the students in the level reading group. And they're able to have book conversations, conversations about their books. Uh, on Edmodo through uh, establishing posts, responding to posts that I have made regarding the book, or that they'll come up with on their own. And then they respond to each other and have this interactive dialogue. And, and so we can reflect back to it. So we can come <coughs> and have a meeting later on about something that they read and that, uh, that they have discussed. And we can refer right back to the, the web page, the Edmodo page, where they had recorded that thinking. 
and there's the, the documentation out there. And so that's just one way that we use the technology. Uh, another way is uh, I'll use it for our, my individual conferences with students. I set up a Google Doc for each student in which uh, I just created a rubric that incorporated some of the important things that our class thinks is important for independent reading. The neat thing about having it on the Google Doc is that the students are able to access it at any time and it's updated on the spot. So their parents could actually be at home, uh, have the Google Doc open and participate in the conference with us if they were so inclined. started a parent-teacher conference and we're talking about um, how the student is doing in reading. There's a lot of times where they've been able to come in and say, yes, Mr. Wetzel, I saw that you had posted on this, or I've, I've seen that they're working on this right now. To where it's not a surprise that the parents are not coming in, what am I going to hear about? It's, it's something where they've already seen what we're going to be talking about and and they're a lot of times ready for that information and ready to talk with me about it and ask the questions as opposed to just get the information. Bringing in families is critically important in order to make sure that our kids are on track and on time. And so this, this story that I have for you today is not about a district that's arrived, but it's about a district that's constantly looking at data and asking that question, is this the best that we can do? It's about truly having a clear goal so everyone knows what the work is. It's about aiming high for measures that really matter to kids, not measures that matter to grown-ups or that say your school's good and to get a banner. It's about what is important for kids. And I have to tell you, it's about being willing to take a lot of pushback around that. And it's about realizing that it's up to us, that we must be the ones that change our practice in order for our kids to be successful. So the bottom line for me is leaving our kids with the message that they can become anything. Are we strong enough? Can we make the cut? Can we cross the finish line? Make it out of time. Can we pass the bar?
thank you so much for sharing that with us and for helping us think with you about the challenges that you have in your school system and um, grounding us all in what difficult work it really is and the number of moving parts there are um, and the lives that are at stake. Thank you. For me, that what you just said is the most important. This is about transforming lives. That's what I look at about. And it's not easy. It, if it were easy, they wouldn't need any of us, right? Anybody could do the work. Questions, comments, pushes, challenges? I, I welcome all of that. Um, Cindy is a, um, you know, my interest in special education, and uh, it could help us by giving one, two, or three uh, challenges you're seeing in terms of special education uh, to get us thinking about how we might partner with you. You know, uh, I mentioned to Elizabeth that as a special educator, I became a little bit disillusioned about our field for one reason. It's become too much about the paperwork and not about what we're actually doing with the kids. I don't know how we move that dial. We need to be accountable and have good plans, but I want the teachers and families to spend time on thinking about outcomes for kids and making plans to help them get there. And I worry that we're so driven by compliance that some of those things are in the way. But I think that about not just special ed, Compliance issues that's in place for us in, in terms of all of that. So some things to think about is how do we truly develop teachers who are at such high skill levels that they can truly meet the, these diverse needs and feel the, the autonomy to be creative while making sure that kids are learning things that are important to their lives. Most of our special ed kids need to be on the same trajectory as college and careers as everybody else and we've got to be better than the average teacher in order to figure out how to, to make that happen for them. So high quality teachers trying to advocate for less bureaucracy and more meaningful planning and uh, to just continue to strengthen partnerships with families. We do the three top things on my list. And of course also early intervention. The earlier the better. The earlier the better. Um. Most of the research on urban education that I'm familiar with um, emphasizes the building model as the, as the key. And you say yourself, you have enormous variation in your district in those buildings. Um, so I'm just curious about the kinds of initiatives that you, I mean, I understand you need to have two goals at this point. But what kinds of sort of building level initiatives would you see lining up with one? You know, uh, we truly believe in systems work. And because of our experience with First Things First, that with systems work with, with lots of site-based autonomy, we realize that that gets building so far. But systems have lots of resources that we can leverage to help move forward. So our buildings are expected to lead within these parameters, these goals and meeting these indicators, while at the same time crafting supports for, that are unique for the community in which their children come from. So many have uh, developed extended school day, extended school year opportunities. That's not a universal thing that we do. Many have uh, different resources that come in that are tied to developing literacy and strong academic skills, and we welcome that. But we discourage going off on, on their own because they then don't have the resources from the school district, the curriculum, the intense focus around leadership development, professional development. So we think the systems really matter. Well, I know that that's going against the stream because much of the focus now, the federal government's programs are all going to buildings. And I get that because oftentimes school systems haven't been clearly focused with resources and support that have mattered and frankly gotten in the way. But so the buildings are, are they have that defined autonomy but within this framework that we believe is critical for all of our kids. And another thing to think about, we have more than 50% mobility within our district in a given year. Some schools have as much as 80%. So this notion of a guaranteed curriculum, and our teachers have instructional pacing guides set, so they need to be within this window every nine weeks, 
that's for our kids because I may start my week in one building and something happened family-wise and I find myself in another classroom. And we don't want that disjointed experience for our children. So that's why we think systems work is so important, if it's the right one. Yes, so, you probably pretty easy on those days. 20,000 students to monitor and keep a few staff. So, when you look at your day, what are the couple, two things that you say, you've got to be sure on a day-to-day -day basis, this is what I want to get done to inspire excellence in my district. Thank you for that question. Well, I have organized the system a little bit unique, uh, as a superintendent. Uh, I am the instructional leader, and I have two assistant superintendents who supervise the building principals and all of that work that happens there. I have protected time. I have said to my principals, you must be in classrooms at least two hours a day. I'm in classrooms at least 12 hours a week at protected time. So for me, a good day is when I have been in classrooms. I walk in every classroom in the building. I talk to kids. I talk to teachers. I try to understand what is the real work here? What are our challenges? So and therefore, my days are very long because all the other things I need to attend to as a superintendent happen after the school day. I'll be around if you have other questions or concerns. Again, I'm so pleased that uh, I was able to come and share a little bit about our work. I hope that it sparks some interest in you, uh, and we invite you to become partners in, in the work, because we truly are uh, going to become one of the top 10 school districts. And I know we're there when every one of those kids say, I can be anything. Thank you. Thank you.